Hey everyone, welcome back to the final day of ETS 21. We have a riveting fireside chat with Audrey Zibelman, the VP of the X Moonshot Factory, joined by Dr. Andrea Rotolo, the Senior Director of Modernization at Liberty Utilities. You both have such impressive and impactful paths in your energy careers, so you both really don't need an introduction, but I'll pass the mic to Audrey first to give a quick introduction and background of yourself for ETS 21 audience today. Great. Well, thank you. And it's, it's wonderful to be here. So I'm, um, I'm actually the vice president of X's Moonshot for the Grid. There's mm -hmm. a, a number of different moonshots within X, and I'm just honored to be part of an organization that so, is so fundamentally focused on making the world better. The, um, but it's interesting, I joined X, which is part of Alphabet, the Google parent, after 30 years in the power industry where I was able to do everything from being a regulator to a utility executive at Excel for a good deal of time to uh, the chief operating officer of PJM, the chair of the New York uh, Commission and the wake of Sandy and the development of REV and most recently as the CEO and managing director of the Australian Energy Market Operator, which is the national grid operator for the country of Australia. So I, I feel like I'm, I'm arriving now back to into technology with a strong re recognition that the path to decarbonization is going to require the integration of the brightest minds in power systems with the brightest minds in computer engineering AI, machine learning, because fundamentally the path to decarbonization will need to be preceded by the path to di digitalization of the power system and making information more available. I'll talk about that a bit more, but uh, it's an honor to be here today. And certainly I feel like one of the luckiest people in the world to be have landed at X and to continue to be part of this conversation. I think this over to you. Yes. Aurora. So thank you so much uh, for having me here. It's such an honor to be part of this conference, this event. It's so wonderful. And to do this fireside chat with Audrey. So I'm Andrea Rotolo. Uh, in my current role, I'm the Senior Director of Grid Modernization and Innovation at Liberty Utilities. Liberty is the parent company of 42 subsidiary utilities that provide customers with services in electricity, water, wastewater, and gas across North America and in Chile and Bermuda. Uh, I'm passionate about customer-centric modernization, adapting to climate disruption, reducing carbon emissions, and building a more reliable, resilient, efficient, and smarter grid with high-performing teams. So hello, Audrey, it's great to see you again. Uh, it's been a while since we were in the same room back in the days of reforming the Energy Vision Rev in New York, uh, where you were chair of the New York Public Service Commission. In those days, as part of the Rev proceeding, one of the things we did is that we looked 20 years out, right, to what the grid would need to be then in the future. And then we worked back from there to what had to be changed today to enable that future state to be realized. And that was almost six years ago now. So our first question is, in your view, are we on track to see in the grid of the future that we envisioned then? And in what ways has your vision of the future of the green been, uh, been updated since then? Thanks, and, and Andrea, it's great to see you and I certainly, hope next year we're all in the same rooms and be, because I, it's always a lot more fun. And, and I appreciate the conversation. So, you know, it, it's a great question. When we started REV, it was really focused on the fact that what we saw in the wake of Sandy, that in order to build out a more resilient system, we needed to take advantage of technolo technology change, particularly as we thought about distributed energy resources and how they themselves, whether it's rooftop solar or batteries or small generators or fuel cells or electric vehicles, 
can actually provide the types of resources to develop out the decarbonized system in a way that's efficient. And that's particularly true, you know, well, it's, not, it's particularly true everywhere, but in large cities like New York City or large, um, it, it becomes a, another set of issues that we need to consider. And so what we realized in New York is, is that it's not going to be just an issue of technology. The technology almost could take care of itself. What we needed to do was think about the policy and the regulations that needed to be changed in order to uh, allow for the scale and the deployment of these resources. And that meant changing the nature of the utility from thinking about the fact that their role was just to deliver energy to the consumer, but actually to become the distribution system operators, what we called it, and, in, and integrate with distributed energy resources, because by allowing for that kind of innovation, they themselves can drive efficiency in the system they could make the grid more resilient, and also they can help it make it more affordable. We did that. And then we also recognized that on the scale of the large bulk power system, we needed to change policies to make sure we can integrate renewables more easily. We provided more opportunities for competition and with number of programs like in solar and wind that were administered by NYSERDA to drive down cost. And I think, you know, when I look back and I see where New York is now, we've made a lot of progress. We're seeing a lot of advantages. The um, Governor Hochul just announced two major projects yesterday that are fantastic around integration of renewables and certainly a really ambitious program around the integration of offshore wind. So I feel really good that we, we sort of got the ball rolling and, and it's picking up steam. But I think fundamentally when, you know, your question about the grid of the future, I think is it's a really good one because as we know, power systems worldwide operate very much in the same way. They might have different topologies, but the physics are the same. And when I think about where we're seeing it and are we on the path, I, I, I have to look at what we've, we're seeing in Australia where the process of decarbonization and the integration of renewables is happening at breathtaking speed. And the learnings we're seeing there is again, the technology, we can make it work, but we are gonna need better tools to, to both design, operate and manage the grid to make it much more efficient. And that, that will require really fast learnings, shared learnings, shared knowledge, and really thinking about how we can apply artificial intelligence machine learning, advanced computing, so that all grids across the world have the tools they need to be able to really think, be able to integrate renewables in a way that meets the needs of consumers. Great, thank you for sharing those insights, Audrey. So you just talked us through some of the key aspects of your vision of the future of the grid. Now, going a bit deeper into what you're working on now, and what we're all working on in the utility sector for some of our specific projects and objectives. Our next question is, in 10 years, what does success look like for you and your team at X and for the utility and energy sector as a whole? Sure. Um, so, you know, what I what I saw in Australia, and I have to refer back to that because of the challenges that we confronted there as we were retiring fossil generation and replacing it with a combination of distributed energy, solar, wind, and batteries, is that what, what the, the grid fundamentally needs is the capability to have the compute cap computer analysis, the that they can, that system operators, governments, investors can actually see what the power system's going to need when we retire conventional generation and replace it with advanced technologies. Because we have to remember, we've never operated a grid that was based on these technologies. And so what we need to know is on a technical and physical basis, when those resources retire, how are we going to manage to make sure we manage frequency, we manage voltage, we manage system strength, all the things that are necessary for the physics of the system to work, and that the system is flexible enough to address the fact that we now have, as our largest resources, renewables that depend on weather conditions in order to maintain reliability. So we need to have a lot more foresight, predictive analysis than we do today. 
So my, my vision for what we're achieving and our focus at, at, at X on our grid moonshot is to work with partners internationally. We're working with AES today. We're also working with the uh, Chilean uh, system operator to really start thinking about well, what's gonna be necessary. How do we envision what's gonna happen? And how do we both take a, a, a system and make sure that we can model it down to the nanosecond because that's where issues happen when you're talking about a decarbonized grid and then have the foresight to say, well, what do we do to make sure that as we're replacing <clears throat> the retiring resources, we're making the best use of, of consumer capital because ultimately consumers pay for this to drive the greatest level of efficiency and doing it in an environment where we know the climate is getting harsher so that we're thinking about it as a way to make sure that the system we're building is more resilient, more affordable, more efficient than it was previously. So that's, that is, that's our focus at X. And what in 10 years, what I hope to see is that the way we're developing our tools and I, and I suspect others will be doing so too, becomes really that intelligence layer of the grid and the system itself becomes more transparent and helps drive innovation because everybody can then help. And I, you know, and I think about it as a moonshot because it is around saving the world. It's too important for one, one entity to do it. We all need to collaborate and to do that, we need to make the information available and accessible for everybody. Wow, well, you just outlined some really good aspirational and critical targets for all of us in the utility sector. Um, if we focus for a minute now on just your piece of the larger puzzle and you just share some insights, um, the work you're doing in your role today at X, what do you see as the gap in the market that X is working to address? And also, why do you believe the gap still exists now and needs the work that you are going uh, doing and going to do to close it? Well, you know, I think that as we think about the process of decarbonization, it is fundamentally going to be an issue around data in the sense of the amount of data and information we need to manage a decarbonized system. The system is going to be faster. We're replacing really, you know, in the U.S., thousands of generators with trillions of devices that need to be coordinated, and that has to happen worldwide. And we have to think about how we can automate and how we use systems at the edge. So AI and machine learning become really critical. It's just too much information to think about the type of con command and control dispatch that we've done historically. We have to architect things differently. And one thing you know, that I recognize of you know, I, why I was so excited to join Alphabet and X is that the ability to think about how we manage data, the ability to think about how we apply AI and machine learning and advanced computing to speed up the process. We can't take you know, 12, 18 months to connect solar and wind to the grid. We'll never get there. We have to think about how do we speed these processes up, but provide the confidence because essentially it has to work. We know it's an essential service. And so working with partners to create those tools is really important. I think the, it's the reason that uh, we, where we are today is, is that we now have an opportunity to take all the learnings that we've learned in, in sort of among digital uh, organizations like Alphabet, which is ex, you know, exceptionally good at these things and apply it to the power systems. And I think we've recognized in the utility industry that the tools that historically were used to manage the system are, are not going to be sufficient and we need to develop new capabilities in order to make sure that people who are designing and operating the systems have the capability to visualize and then even virtualize what could happen so it's they, under, they know, because we can't hope it works, we have to know it works before we invest in the system. And so they, to me, it's I think about it this way, the tools we had worked perfectly for the systems we had previously. The systems we are designing are going to be very different. And we need to make sure that the computational tools are there ahead of the change so that we, the decisions we make are, as most, are most economically efficient as possible. 
Right, well, it's great to see the world of tech, software tech, the kind of work that Google does coming together uh, with solving our most difficult energy challenges. As you said, speeding this up is critical. So could we maybe generalize this kind of thinking from your specific work at X to how other tech companies should be thinking about the opportunity in the energy transition? What, how do the learnings from the world of software tech companies bring new insights to working with energy systems? What X experience and work informs how you are approaching the X electric grid moonshine that might be useful for others who want to bring more advanced software to the utility sector? Well, there are a few things around X that I, uh, at X that X has uh, done extraordinarily well that, that um, I'm excited to apply to the power sector. One is the fact is that we recognize that these uh, major transformational issues and what X's thesis is, is they want to solve problems that, that can benefit billions of people in the world and are really 10X changes in technology. But we can't do that in labs. We have to do this in the real world. So one of the things our approach is, is to work with partners who, are, who see the future and see the need to have better to compute tools. And I'm willing to partner with, with us in the fast iteration and the, and the um, type of uh, innovation that is necessary for the grid. Because we, we have to prototype, we have to try, we have to make sure it works. And, and it's, it's a different way of approaching. And it's also the humility of recognizing that we, you know, we're, we're starting with a hypothesis. We have to make it work obviously for our future but it has to start with the humility. We can't do this alone. We have to work together because it's, it's through this combination of knowledge that we'll have the greatest successes. So to me, I'd like us to think about that we're applying the best thinking in computer science and engineering with the best thinking in power system science and engineering and maths and markets, and as well as policy. And through all of that, we'll start to see the pathway to make sure that the future is, is, a, is a, with a grid that's more resilient, more affordable, cleaner, reliable, and accessible to all, that we can have it there. We just start with the vision and then we work through the problem together. Well, that's fantastic, Audrey. You certainly gave the tech companies people in our audience and uh, well, actually everyone in the sector a lot to think about. Um, you know, we've been talking about how much value a diversity of approaches and different companies can bring to grid operators and to the utility sector as a well. whole. That's the importance of diversity at the level of the big players in the market and the new companies that may be small now, but can turn out to be disruptive. So looking internally into any one of those companies, Diversity within teams is also an essential topic that is top of mind for a lot of people these days. So from your perspective, how important do you consider diversity to be in your teams? And what do you do or what do you think the utility sector can do to attract top talent, millennials and Gen Z leaders, software engineers and data scientists? So I, um, let me just start with, with one thought on this. Um, we need to have a diverse workforce, full stop. There's, there's no question about that. And it not only is it makes sense for business, it makes sense for morally, but it's it just, we need to get there. And you know, one of the reasons I joined X actually was when I heard the uh, CEO of X, Astro Teller, in a uh, YouTube video talk about the importance of diversity and the fact that he is committed to making sure that as we think about all the futures of all the industries that X works in, that it's a diverse workforce because that it will make for a much stronger future. I think that the fact of the matter is, you know, when I think about people entering uh, the industry now, and I saw this at AEMO uh, where I, uh, in Australia and certainly now at uh, New York and certainly now is, is that one of the things millennials in particular are looking for is to make sure that their, their work has purpose. And I think when it comes to the power industry, you know, I, you can't forget a couple things. One is, 
we cannot decarbonize the world. In other words, we can't save the planet unless we decarbonize the grid. That, that is essential. And grid decarbonization will, re, will allow for decarbonization of the transportation sector, of industrial, heating, all sorts of things. We can't decarbonize the grid without the brightest minds coming to this sector and thinking about the problems that need to be solved. And so I, I almost think it's probably not a problem to attract bright people because it, it is really where it is all gonna happen. And fundamentally, when the power system works and when people have access to uh, affordable and clean electricity, the whole economy works. If it doesn't work, the economy falters. And so if people are thinking about a career where they wanna have impact, where they wanna have purpose, where they wanna make sure that they're doing something besides just earning a paycheck, the power sector is really the place to be. And so I am actually really optimistic that it's not gonna be a problem to attract a diverse workforce. And what we ought to, and, and in fact, what we will be facing very soon is a is competition for these brightest minds, but that's good. That's a that's a good problem to have. Thank you. You brought up a very important point here, and it's impact. And so, it, at the same time, you brought up how much and how fast we need to decarbonize. So, thank you for that message. You are encouraging companies to create those environments so that impact can be created at a fast pace that will attract that top talent. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm taking some notes. I'm sure uh, our audience is too. We've covered all, um, might not have caught it in their notes. Um, and this might be something you've uh, already said, but um, what, what is the one thing, uh, what is the one thing that you want our audience to not forget, to take away from this conversation today? I think there, there's probably more than one thing, but there's there's two. That one there's um, certain critical things that I think we need, we have an advantage to do now. One is is that it is going to be a collaborative effect. We can't assume that we're going to be just one entity or one company that's going to solve it, and it is a moonshot. It requires industry and uh, tech, as well as innovators, to get together and work together to make sure that we are solving the issue. The second is it's a whole world problem. The nice thing about uh, electricity is the physics don't change. I discovered that when I went to Australia. Works the same as it works in the US. And the, and the challenge then is, is how do we do fast learnings? We don't have time in, anymore to say that every utility around the world has to demonstrate and pilot. We have to move more quickly and we have to move to scale. So one of the things that we're looking to do at Access is really sort of think working with our partners, but learning how to do shared learnings quickly. And that's one area where virtualization can help. And so that we all as an industry can lift each other up with the experiences we have. The learnings in Australia are relevant to the learnings in Texas and vice versa. How do we make sure that happens seamlessly and it can get to Britain and Europe and South America at the same time? So to me, these kinds of conferences are important. And what's more important is, is that as an, as an industry, we come together and say, we, we just have to solve the issue and we have to bring it, we, we need to bring these various domains into the same room. Excellent. Thank you for helping us put this, this a moonshot collaboration, this is a global issue, shared learnings in focus. Uh, now, one final question before we run out of time. Maybe some career advice for our audience, um, and myself included, who hope <laughs> to have an impact in the energy transition that might uh, approach all of these things you have done and are still going to do in your career. If you could talk with your younger self right now, what advice would you give to guide yourself in the most impactful and meaningful career path possible within the energy transition to the decarbonize the smarter group of the future? Certainly. So, I, you know, I think that uh, what's most important is that when people have a passion for having impact, 
uh, simply don't don't let the naysayers get in your way. I, I started at in this industry at a point in time uh, where where the value of solar and wind was hotly debated, and probably is still hotly debated in, in a lot of corners. And you know, and there's always a lot of naysayers. There's always going to be people who want to bring you down. And I think you know the biggest advice is follow your passion, go after it. Don't worry about them. I I heard. Um, uh, our, our CEOs uh, talked the other day about the fact that, you know, life is sort of like juggling balls. And I thought it was a brilliant statement. He said, you've got life, you've got family, you've got friends, and you've got your job. All those balls are juggling at one time. Everything else is glass, but work. Work is a rubber ball. So if things don't work well at work, you'll bounce back. Everything else will crash. So don't worry about work follow your passion, and make sure you keep balance in your life. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. Thank you to our audience. This has been a wonderful, uh, insightful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.